Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the ninth meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, as usual, your mobile phones, can you please put them at least in an order that doesn't interfere with proceedings? Our only agenda item today is to take evidence in a round table format on earnings in Scotland. And for this particular evidence session, we, uh, we'll take evidence from Anna Ritchie Allen, who's the Executive Director of Close the Gap, John Gallagher, who's the Scottish organiser of Unison, Thorsten Bell from the Director of the Resolution Foundation, Professor David Bell, Professor of Economics at University of Stirling, Helen Martin, Assistant General Secretary of the STUC, Hazel Brown, who's the leader of Exceptional Service Quality Cornerstone, and Russell Gunson, who's the Director of the IPPR in Scotland. I warmly welcome all of our witnesses to the meeting this morning. Thank you for coming along and helping with our proceedings. Uh, this roundtable format, for those who have been involved before, will know it's intended to create as much a free flow discussion as we can possibly achieve. Um, so if you, if you want to contribute at any stage, please let myself know or catch the eye of the clerks and we'll, we'll make sure you get in at any time. Um, the discussion is going to be based loosely around four themes and an individual MSP will, take, will kick off one of the theme areas just to get us going. As I say, feel free to contribute at any stage and look, look to make co you know, contributions if you, you feel you, that you want to do it at that particular time. Um, so let's get it underway. And I'm going to ask James Kelly to begin the session on how public sector pay compares with the private sector. And I'm the first to recognise it's all cut across from one area to another. That's inevitable. James, kick off, please. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener. And again, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming along this morning and providing us with your expertise and experience. Uh, the first area that we're interested in exploring is the, the difference in pay in the public and uh, private sector. And one of the trends that's been identified is that public sector pay is at a higher, uh, pay in the public sector is at a higher premium than the private sector. And that is more so the case in Scotland. So initially what we're interested in exploring are what are the differences between the public sector and the private sector in terms of what drives uh, wage levels? Okay, so who'd like to kick off with their first set of thoughts on that? And I see lots of people looking at me and being quiet, but John Gallagher, so, and then we'll come to Hazel. Thank you. I suppose, I suppose an opening salvo for me would be obviously not to take from that, that that workers in the public sector are doing well in terms of their wages. Um, obviously, real terms earnings at the moment are around about 2008 level. And in terms of cost of living negotiations up until last year, when the Scottish government lifted the 1%, obviously wages have been pretty flatline in terms of that. Some sectors have feared uh, better than others. Um, there are sectors in Scotland still labouring under the 1% ceiling from UK departments of civil servants, which obviously is not Unison's concern. The, th the third sector in terms of social care is struggling in terms of wages. So I would just, from a public sector point of view, let's not say that all in the garden is rosy. 2018 was a okay year, I wouldn't put it any more than okay. Obviously, it did not address catching up. And also, uh, the public sector is obviously not a homogenous unit. Pay for similar jobs varies wildly between local authority areas, between universities, between colleges. So don't assume either that a worker doing the same job across different parts of Scotland will be on the same wages. Okay, thank you, John. Hazel Brown? Uh, yeah, I just also add that I, I sit on the board of CCPS, which is a coalition of care and support providers Scotland. So coming from Cornerstone perspective, but also as a board member for Cornerstone. Um, when you talk about earnings, really for us as an employer, it's around about things like terms and conditions that we cannot compete with the uh, public and private at all. Uh, we haven't got a chance in terms of being able to offer similar pensions and sickness. Uh, there was a bit of research done about 15 years ago when um, local authorities started outsourcing social care. And at that point in time, we, as a social care provider, third sector, we were able to offer similar terms and conditions, but that has just been eroded and eroded over the last sort of 15 years. So we, we can't compete. So if, uh, you know, if, if we're in a particular area, North Lancashire Council advertises posts for carers, we have a glut of our, our, our people going because we just can't offer the same, even though we're trying as a provider to offer better hourly rates and above the Scottish living wage. It's, it's a whole package that we can't compete with. Okay, okay. Anybody else like to 
David. Just to say, I mean, the differences in average pay are, are reflect differences in the kinds of work that are done in the public and private sector. So typically, the work in the public sector is, is more skilled, though obviously there's a spread right across the, um, the uh, uh, distribution. Um, the movement of the uh, gap between public and private sector has been of interest. Um, the um, private sector suffered more at the start of the recession and subsequently uh, pay restraint uh, in the public sector has held, has, has kind of narrowed that, uh, that gap back again. But, um, you know, earnings, as Hazel says, is only part of the story and, and the whole package um, on terms and conditions does matter. And in terms of pensions, dare I say it, um, the public sector tends to be uh, better provided than, than, than the private sector is. So looking you know, in the round, um, uh, it, it is the case that typically uh, uh, public sector uh, remuner well, packages are, are better. But, you know, that, that uh, neglects the fact that there are people in the public sector who, who, who aren't that well paid, who, who, do, uh, who do struggle. Uh, but in, in straight comparisons, you'll find that the um, gap between rich and poor in terms of the private sector is bigger than the gap between the rich and poor in the public sector. Okay, Torsten, and then Helen. Um, I don't want to replicate lots of um, what David just said, so that's the, the big picture. Um, I'd say the, the big picture difference across the UK, so if you look at the premium, it looks bigger in Scotland, public sector premium, that is principally driven, it's partly driven on the margins by slightly better pay growth in Scotland in the last few years, but largely it's driven by the lower private sector pay in Scotland. So the premium doesn't reflect higher public sector pay. It's about what's going on in the private sector um, broadly. I'd say when you want to think, obviously the public sector is a slightly bigger part of the um, Scottish economy overall, and that was very important in the if you, if the big picture on pay in Scotland, which you may come on to, is the reasonably fast catch-up and overtaking on some measures during the 2000s. And that a part of that is having a larger public sector, seeing larger pay rises in the run-up to the financial crisis, especially the last few years into the financial crisis. So you don't want to, while we're all focused on the the relative gap, what's driving that in different time periods is pretty important rather than just how big the premium looks like in raw terms. Okay, Helen? Yeah, I think uh, I'd just like to add to that to say that I think there is an issue of really high levels of low pay within the private sector within Scotland. We've got some industries where um, collective bargaining coverage is very, very low. So, for example, in hospitality and agriculture, um, in some parts of construction, particularly where you get out into the sort of um, sort of tier two, tier three kind of workers within the construction industry, there'll be people who are who who see their pay being pushed down consistently over years and do um, therefore suffer by from quite low levels of of um, from quite low wages and insecure work, um, and that is partly to do with um, collective bargaining coverage and and the lack of sort of. Uh, the ability of unions to bargain for these workers for various different reasons in different sectors. Um, I think it's uh, important to also recognise the fact that we've had quite a large living wage campaign in Scotland, and that has been very successful in terms of how many companies have signed up to be living wage accredited. Um, we've probably got the highest in the UK in terms of that, yet it doesn't move the measure on how many workers are suffering um, from pay that's below the living wage, um, which sits sort of static around 20%. So I think um, some of our focus going forward needs to be about how we make sure that we raise pay in real terms for the, for the lowest paid, and we try to improve collective bargaining coverage and we try to improve the security of that work in the private sector in particular. Thank you. Anna? Um, a comment on the gender dimensions of pay practice. So I think generally we can say that public sector employers are more likely to have done an equal pay review, which women are, are more likely to benefit from. But in the private sector, um, we do see widespread 
pay practice that is premised on discretionary pay, which evidence shows that women are more likely to um, be disbenefited from that. And so um, there's potential for um, discrimination um, in relation to pay, but also that sustains women's lower pay. And just to follow up on Helen's point about um, the living wage, that um, two thirds of the workers earning below the living wage are women. And so there's a, a, another clear gender dimension there as well. Russell? Yeah, so about 20% of employees in Scotland are within the public sector. So, of course, that's a big chunk of those in employment. We need to look at the, the levels of pay within public sector directly. But we're also quite interested in what um, you can do in the public sector that can then spill over into the private sector. Um, so whether that be, as an example, whether that be competing in the local regional labour markets or whether that be through procurement um, and through that more soft power that the public sector is likely to have over some of those that are paid uh, at low levels in the private sector. So for us, there's an absolute, of course, direct uh, policy interest in what pay looks like in the public sector, but equally, what can we do to influence the private sector through setting pay in the public sector is a real interest to us. And on the, on the living wage, which Helen raised, um, and we've got a better take up in Scotland, yes, I, I heard that, but is that mostly public sector driven or is that, as Russell was hinting at, are people from the private sector then, for want of a better word, coattailing on what the public sector is doing or is it the other way around? Um, well, I mean, there, there's, I think there's over a thousand living wage credited employers in Scotland now and they come from a variety of sectors but what we have tended to see is that it tends to be people who don't have high numbers of low paid workers within their workforce so um, you're, you're not seeing high levels of retail employers for example signing up to be living wage credited so in that respect it is making a difference around the margins but the overall pictures of workers in Scotland is that it sticks around 20% so you know it is a puzzle that we're seeing this high level of accreditation but we're not necessarily seeing the impact that we'd like to see Okay, Torsten, I think you another point um, so We set the living wage um, rate in uh, Scotland does have slightly higher but uh, this, it's, when it comes to the labour market as a whole we're not it's not a, a thing <laughs> it's not if not talk it's not enough people yeah so it's a really important campaign we support it we're members we sign up but there's not enough people affected by the living wage rates for it to be what matters for your labour market as a whole yet much as you might want that uh, to be the case so good campaigning the public sector led in Scotland like it is across the um, some other parts of the UK but principally in Scotland is particularly public sector led but in terms of number of workers affected by it we're you know it's important for those people it's really important that's why we put lots of time in calculating it right but it doesn't change your average earnings rates it's too small yeah but uh, that takes us back to Russell's point and trying to use the public sector as a, an exemplar effectively is, is not been as successful in that area as we might have expected. But Russell? Point. So um, Wales and Northern Ireland, who also have a, a higher um, proportion of employees, public sector employed, have far higher numbers of um, employees paid under the living wage. So there is something different happening in Scotland compared to Northern Ireland and Wales, which is, so I think Scotland's at around 19%. I think Wales is 26% paid beneath the living wage and Northern Ireland's up closer to 30. So quite significant differences showing that there must be something other than a dominance by the public sector um, in terms of our pay structure. John? Public bodies, though, get living wage accreditation because well, part of the terms of that is if they have outsourced contracts, those contracted out services need to apply that living wage rate, not necessarily immediately, so sometimes there is a time lag of a couple of years, but it does mean that those companies, if a public body is living wage accredited, must apply the living wage at some agreed time. And that is important because to achieve that otherwise, particularly when some of those companies don't recognise trade unions and there's no collective bargaining mechanism, would be very difficult and probably involve industrial action to achieve £9 an hour with, with some of those companies. So it is important that public bodies, as many public bodies as possible, obviously we would prefer they didn't outsource at all, but where they do, it does introduce a discussion about wage rates in that privatised provider. OK, Patrick? Um, I was interested by one of the, the comments that uh, Russell Gunson made about the, not just the comparison, but the influence that could exist between 
public pay and, and the wider economy. But if, if the kind of sectors that Helen Martin was talking about, like retail and construction, are the ones that we're most concerned about, those might be the sectors where there's l less of an influence between what the public sector uh, offers in terms of pay and remuneration uh, and what the private sector does. So are there ways of maximising that influence, maximising that leadership role, and, and what are those, those ways? Uh, and, and I guess also just to, to think about public sector pay in its own right, uh, the, the finance secretary uh, just a few months ago said, when he announced the public sector pay policy for the, the, the current financial year, he said it continues the journey of restoration of public sector pay. And that was a, a description of a, a, a pay settlement that almost reached inflation for, at the low end and didn't reach inflation for other people. So is there a journey toward restoration of the value of, of public sector pay? Is that journey happening? Uh, and do people have an any, any indication that they expect it to happen or to continue? David? Just yeah, also going to pick up on, uh, on, on Russell's point and, and maybe um, say something that Hazel was going to say. The, the care sector, which is probably the fastest growing sector in the economy, is in a complete bind because on the one hand, you've got the living wage pushing up on costs and on the other, you've got local... Uh, local government contract for for um, what they are prepared to pay per week for someone in a care home or receiving care. And as a result of that, we are not seeing any uh, expan expansion of the sector because it is fundamentally unprofitable. Uh, and even though we have a very challenging demography over the next decade, couple of decades, um, we're not seeing the growth in care provision, largely because of this squeeze that the, the care sector is being affected by. Hazel. I think David probably just said most of what I was going to say, but yes, it, it is about, about the squeeze. Uh, obviously, you know, the application of the Scottish living wage in the, in the social care sector, one of the lowest paid sectors, is, is great, and we, and we welcome that. But we have a struggle, particularly when you're an organisation like ourselves across Scotland, of how you implement it, because all the local authorities are, are, are calculating it differently um, and how they do it. And I guess the concern is, you know, for the last few years, years there's been a, a, a particular amount of ring-fenced money that's come to the sector to support the Scottish living wage. But increasingly, it looks like in the future that our commissioning partners will just expect us to meet that as a business as usual thing, um, which is just yet another squeeze that the sector just can't cope with. Anna? I think we can't talk about care without talking about women as well, given the fact that they comprise the majority of the workforce and also thinking about the early years workforce as well. Um, and the, the reason that um, care work is, is so low paid is, of course, because of the economic undervaluation of the work itself, which is inherently gendered. And so the, what the literature says is that there's, it's actually quite difficult to challenge this. But um, one way maybe looking at which others have spoken about is using state wage setting powers there. Um, and I, I suppose one aspect where this has been done in a piecemeal fashion has been um, Scottish Government's commitment to um, pay early years uh, childcare workers um, who are delivering the funded entitlement, the living wage. But that in itself creates some challenges because it's only for the funded entitlement and so it doesn't actually address the wider problem. So I think what we need to see if we're going to actually um, tackle that undervaluation of that type of work which is done by women is a much more um, strategic um, investment approach to um, identify care as a growth sector um, and add it on and include it in the Scottish Government's economic strategy. Okay. Uh, I've got quite a few, John. I'll come back to you. Uh, Russell? Yeah, I think on Patrick's two broad questions. So on the first one, is there a journey to catch up? Um, there's a long way to go if we're even on that journey. So across the whole economy, real wages are still lower than they were pre-crash. And we've never seen anything like this in, the hist in modern history. So this is 10 years and counting, if not a little longer than that now. So you would have to see a long a long catch-up with above inflation pay increases across both public and private sector. Um, the UK, as I say, is in unprecedented times, but Scotland in recent past and in uh, the short term looks to be, the projections are that we will underperform against even the UK's very poor wage growth over the coming years. 
So we really need to get inclusive growth going, we really need to get the economy going so that we can get those pay rise across public and private sector that are above inflation to catch up. Um, on the other point around how can we maximise the influence of the public sector over those more distant sectors from public spending. So care and childcare are absolutely are good examples of where there's a much closer relationship, where you would hope there was therefore much more that the public sector could do directly to boost pay. Um, and let's not forget, it's not just the pay floor, living wage is very important, but career progression and job quality are as much, if not more, important than that. But when it comes to retail and the, the big low pay or lower pay sectors in Scotland, you're probably looking at things beyond pay in the public sector. So how can you increase collective bargaining? How can you take a social partnership approach across the economy? Um, how can you drive productivity increases that in those sectors rather than just the growth sectors in Scotland? And most of all, how can you then get those productivity increases into the pay packets of workers at the low end so that we can deliver on all the good words around inclusive growth with reality in terms of pay rises at the low end that outstrip not just inflation, but also outstrip pay rises at the higher end. Um, on on low paid workers, obviously the big picture of what's going on at the moment is um, very fast rises in the national living wage, the minimum wage for over 25 workers. That That is the single largest thing happening to our pay distribution, um, the hourly pay distribution right now. And that is, um, across the UK as a whole, a very big deal. It's a slightly smaller deal in Scotland than it is in um, most of the UK. And that's for good reasons, which is the pay growth in the 2000s in Scotland was broad-based for the whole bottom half of the income distribution. So Scotland has a less unequal uh, pay distribution because it doesn't have as much at the very top. Um, it has about the same as the rest of the UK, minus London and the South East. So if you treat that as a freak show, it looks broadly like the rest. And then the, but the bottom is better. And so because, you're, because your bottom in Scotland is nearer the typical, the national living wage has a smaller bite, as in it lifts the bottom, but less people are on the bottom in Scotland. So that's good news in some ways, because it reflects a better pay distribution in the first place, but it's bad news because lower paid workers are getting less of an increase in Scotland than they are in some other parts of the UK. So in that way, Scotland looks a bit more like London, where London, the national living wage has less bite because there are less workers on the, le on the legal minimum. They're just obviously paying housing costs galore, so it doesn't really do them any good anyway. Helen? Yeah, um, I, I guess I wanted to, to talk to Patrick's initial question about um, how it is that we can push out to industries like construction. And um, we have done quite a bit of thinking on this because um, we were very pleased to see collective bargaining coverage being included within, as an indicator within the effective voice element of the national performance framework. So we've done quite a lot of um, discussions with civil servants now about how it is that you might move that collective bargaining coverage um, indicator. And some of the sectors that we're thinking about are things like construction, hospitality, both social care and child care, for example, as well. And each of these sectors kind of work differently because they're in different starting points. Um, for uh, something like construction, there are elements of that workforce that are quite well organised. There are elements of um, national agreements already in existence where terms and conditions have already been bargained. But the issue is that they're not always enforced and not all workers get access to, to those sorts of terms and conditions. So that's about um, making sure that all workers um, have access to a union, that the union um, gets opportunity to organise on sites, gets access to the sites. Um, it's, an, it's a construction sector is quite scarred by, by blacklisting and quite ruthless behaviour by employers. So that's about um, trying to use the weight of public sector commissioning to ensure that those things can't happen. So we have, a, um, Unite have done a construction sector charter that we are asking to be incorporated into public sector contracts. We're also now looking at whether or not we can put in place sort of helpline and compliance measures where workers can, can get in touch and report if there's any um, poor practice. And it's also about trying to ensure that, you know, workers understand the, the collective agreements that are in place and that those collective agreements are being honoured right through the supply chain of the public sector contracts because um, it might be okay it, with the initial company, but as you go down through the supply chain, things get worse and worse and worse. Um, and the use of umbrella companies 
uh, sort of in increases that kind of pressure on pay and terms and conditions. And we think here the focus on collective bargaining is really important because it is, as Russell says, more than simply pay. It's about terms and conditions, it's about job security, it's about um, how well workers feel that their, their job is benefiting them in the round. Um, for hospitality, it's a different picture again, because that is a sector where really there is no union penetration at all. Um, it's, there, there's quite high levels of insecure work, high levels of zero hours contracts. Um, there's quite, the competitiveness in the sector is, is quite large. So we're looking for champions really to start uh, trying to um, sort of increase the collective bargaining penetration within that sector. It's, it's, it's quite a different picture. And we hope that the um, public sector as a commissioner and a sort of user of services in terms of like using hotels or using um, could, could drive some of that forward. Um, but I think that's a more challenging sector because there's less penetration there. For um, social care and for early years, however, I think there is a clear role for the public sector um, to, and we would like to see sectoral bargaining really within that sector because um, right now, it is the case that there's, as um, Professor Bell sort of outlined, that there's a real tension between commissioning rates and the terms and conditions that, that workers then receive. And actually, if we're honest with ourselves, the public sector drives the insecurity as the Fair Work Convention um, exposed within their social care um, report not a few weeks ago. And, you know, uh, Professor Bell talked about these services as being <coughs> fundamentally unprofitable. Well, to me, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. They are public services. They are doing a, a key role within the public sector. And if we are going to commission them like this to the private sector, then we need to be doing so in such a way that you're not simply driving efficiency off the back of low-paid work, and particularly low-paid female workers, as Anna rightly pointed out. Um, for childcare workers, sorry, this is my last point. For childcare workers, I think um, simply focusing on the living wage isn't really enough. Um, these are very high-skilled jobs. I think valuing, valuing the labour is very important. But it's also recognising the fact that you can have childcare workers, some of whom work in the public sector and some of whom work in the private sector, but they do practically the same job. And yet there is a £13,000 pay gap between the public sector worker and the private sector worker. And again, that sort of drives issues within the sector. It drives a de-skilling of the private sector roles into the public sector, particularly as the expansion happens. So I think having a good look at this, focusing more on sectoral bargaining rather than simply the living wage and trying to get terms and conditions that, that don't drive some of those pressures in the sector and don't drive sort of poverty wages for female workers is something that we really need to focus on. John, and then I'm going to come to Torsten, but I'll need to move on after yeah, that because we've, I'll be we've quick. had a I mean, good opening, which has been uh, very useful. Helen's covered a few points. Here, here to sectoral bargaining for early years in adult social care. Um, the, the progress on the living wage is welcome, but it does uh, mask a basket of jobs, which is where the living wages have been accepted as the sort of rate for the job, but it's not necessarily the right rate for the job. No disrespect to shop workers, but if it's a st sh stacking shelves is a living wage rate, then delivering the not to five curriculum in an early year setting is not certainly delivering adult social care to vulnerable elderly people in the community is not the appropriate rate. So it does mask a, 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 a can of worms and we shouldn't just assume because a living wage is applicable that that's a good thing. But, but to answer Patrick's question directly, there is no real journey of uh, restoration, nor is there going to be the opportunity to negotiate pay in Scotland in the public sector for a couple of years because local governments have signed up a three-year deal, health has signed up a three-year deal, the college sector has signed up a three-year deal. So the next time we'll be putting in claims which might have an element of restoration will be 2020. But just as an example, I mean, an early years worker who was on 2228 in 2014 in the, in the local authority sector, if they had had RPI increases, would be on 21929 and they're sitting on 21392, so five, 600 points behind. A registered nurse on a middle ranking grade should be on 26358 with cost RPI increases and is on 24 and a half. So there's a significant and real uh, Theft is a strong word, but theft of wages from public sector workers over the last few years that few people have expectations of getting back and have just suffered the pain of that, suffered the impact of that on their personal budgets and resent that, to be honest, because their job hasn't got any easier. Torsten. Um, I was just going to make one point, actually, just given where our conversation has gone, which is if we're talking about what does the public sector do to raise wages, we're, we're talking here about lots of 
kind of micro direct interventions that the state can do to where it either procures a service or it or its leadership role or its those are all really important but the biggest thing clearly driving slow wage growth right now is weak productivity growth that's the thing it's not changes in union bargaining power they've carried on falling at roughly the same rate they were falling before the crisis maybe slightly slower the levels a bit higher in scotland than overall but the big picture which is falling trade union density is the same but that isn't what's driving weak wage growth it's not increasing monopsony power of big employers it is that we are not seeing productivity growth right now in terms of what's doing it right now obviously what did it during the financial crisis was a big financial crisis and then higher unemployment in the phase afterwards but the problem now is lack of growth and so if you want to boost wages across the economy you need productivity growth and you need faster growth and although scotland's growth in the last 18 months to two years is back in line with UK averages broadly. That is because the UK average has declined again, you may have noticed, over the last two years. So now everybody's doing a bit rubbish. So that is the most important thing. I do think that gets lost in a lot of these discussions because we focus on what can we do for 10 people here, 10 people there, rightly, because policy feels easier there. The, the, that will not solve the problem. The reason why wages are below where they were 10 years ago, the reason why wages look like they're going to be growing slower than they have ever done over the next five years is because of weak productivity growth, first, last, and always. Yeah, I think we've been over that ground quite a few times in this committee, and I'm not, I don't think we've found the answers to some of that yet, but perhaps we'll get some enlightenment in this today. Um, but that actually help, is very helpful, uh, sequencing into Angela Constance's area, which she was going to start off on next, and how Pain Scotland compares with the rest of the UK, and obviously the implications that has for our budget and the, and the fiscal framework. But thank you, thank you very much. It was a very useful opening of the issues. OK, thanks, convener. Um, while I um, often get quite frustrated uh, at our, what can appear like our obsessions between uh, comparing Scotland with the rest of the UK at the expense sometimes of missing a, the wider point or the bigger picture, whether that's at an EU or an international level. Um, nonetheless, for, for this committee, in the context of the fiscal framework and therefore uh, Scotland's budget, uh, how revenues per capita grow in Scotland uh, in comparison to the rest of the UK are fundamentally um, important um, and there's an obvious relationship between earnings growth and uh, revenues growth. What I'm specifically interested in is the fact that the convergence between earnings uh, compared in Scotland uh, to the UK uh, between 2013 and 16 appears to have stalled, plateaued, uh, but worryingly, more recently, 2017-18 figures show that average wages in Scotland grew less quickly uh, than the UK. So I would be interested to know people's views on why this is. What are the consequences of that? Is it a coincidence that this occurs, you know, around the same time as Brexit uncertainty? And what can and should uh, the Scottish Government do uh, to, to assist? Russell. Um, this is a crucial point, as you've um, outlined, in that earnings growth, given how dominant income tax is to now the Scottish Parliament's budget, will be um, right at the heart of any um, differential between what we would have had under pre-devolution and what we will have now. So it's already kicking in. We've seen a differential that's negative to Scotland over the last couple of years, as you say, and projected to see that for the next couple of years that will probably hit revenue in Scotland by hundreds of millions of pounds each year um, already. Um, and so this matters. You know, Some of the pay rises we talked about in the public sector will only be affordable if we can find ways to boost tax revenue. And the most sustainable way of doing that is through um, pay rises in Scotland and productivity increases underpinning it. Um, so what's been happening um, in Scotland? So Torsten, in essence, you didn't quite say productivity, 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 but um, productivity is a crucial point. We all talk about it at the economy level. It is quite well established that there's a link between productivity growth and pay. At the sector level and certainly at the firm level, it gets blurrier as to how that interacts. Um, we've been doing some work with the Scottish Policy Foundation looking at pay and productivity and inclusive growth. And one of the key conclusions, it's a forthcoming report, but one of the key conclusions from that is that we need in Scotland to focus our productivity policy as much on the everyday parts of the economy 
if we want to deliver inclusive growth, as we do on the growth sectors that the Scottish Government have picked out. So one way of reducing low pay is, of course, to move people from low paying sectors into higher paying sectors. But a much more likely way to do this, given the size and scale of employment uh, in some lower pay sectors in Scotland, is to boost pay in lower pay sectors. So what can we do to boost productivity in retail? What can we do to do likewise in tourism, in hospitality, in care? Um, and the answer to that are probably likely to be sector by sector. And they're very likely to be involving employers, employees and government together in making those decisions. Um, so for us, the why is productivity. It's not just that. There's an oil crash. There are other things that may have happened uh, that are specific to Scotland. Brexit is probably less likely, given that it's impacted across the UK at the same time, although you can see differential impacts. Further away from London, for example, the bigger the impacts may well be from Brexit. But overall, cutting through everything else, it's about trying to boost productivity, and particularly in those low pay sectors. Um, the last point I'd say is that automation is both a threat and an opportunity when it comes to this. So the automation around um, uh, technological change, industrial revolution 2.0, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a gendered aspect in that many of the jobs that are likely to be under threat of change from automation are um, currently taken by women um, and in lower paid sectors. The opportunity comes in embracing automation in a way that drives up job quality. And I don't think we're quite on that yet in Scotland. And I think we could do more to look ahead to what automation could bring and to begin sector by sector to understand how we can take the benefits of that in a way that drive the social outcomes that we wish to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, listen, just, just before we move on, Adam and like just come burrow down a bit into some of that. Yeah, th 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 thanks, Convener. I mean, it, it, absolutely fascinating, Russell. Everything, everything you say here, but but, um, but I don't understand what the words mean. And, 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 and I don't, that's and that's I, and a big in, problem. And in, in particular, I don't, I don't understand what boosting productivity in the care sector through increased automation means. So can you just like just, let's just take the care sector, given that there's a lot of expertise around, in that sector around the table today as a, as a case study. And I know the report that you're talking about is forthcoming. And so we, we, could, we, haven't, we don't have it yet. But what, what does it mean to say, let's boost productivity in the care sector? I think that you picked probably the trickiest one in terms of sector. So, so uh, I will come back <laughs> to care. Uh, and that may have been deliberate on your part. but. Um, uh, around retail, I will come back to care, I promise, but, um, but around retail you can see how um, productivity boosts over the long term can absolutely lead to pay increases if you put in place the interventions that ensure that the, the gains from a productivity boost for an individual farm or for a sector go into the pay uh, packets of the lower paid. I hope those words make sense. So uh, productivity, of course, is around getting higher efficiency for the the humans, the, the workers, but also the capital that you've got. Uh, and automation in retail, as you can see, could be a threat because it could displace lots of low paid workers. Equally, there's an opportunity there to try and drive up the quality of workers that remain in the retail sector after uh, automation has happened. Care is much more tricky to measure in terms of productivity. So traditional methods would miss a whole heap of very important things in care. Um, so if you were to do just a normal productivity measure, it would be an input, so the number of hours being put in, or the number of workers, and an output, in that sense, probably the number of people seen. So a productivity increase on paper could be awful for the, the patients or the clients that you're seeing. So you need to tailor how you measure productivity sector by sector. For care, you absolutely need to look at the quality of care. You need to look at the experience that patients are experiencing, but also the experience for workers too. And in there, you can get a much more tailored measure of productivity in uh, for that sector. So automation, I'm not sure, um, you know, in broad terms, across the economy, it has a role. For care, um, it depends where technology takes us. But um, it's probably less around automation and investing in new uh, robots and machines and more quite traditional ways of boosting productivity. So secure contracts that allow businesses to invest in their workers as opposed to very insecure contracts uh, that potentially are self-harming for a business in many ways. Um, so I hope that to some extent answers. But um, and here's what, while we're on care, I might as well make sure you get the opportunity to come in there and then I'll come to Torsten. I know David wants to come in as well. 
Yeah, I, interest in the productivity around care um, is almost entirely measured on exactly what you said, hours of care delivered to how many people, and that's not any measure of any quality at all. Um, and, and, you know, if you put it... People have been struggling with this for quite a few years about how you then measure the outcomes and, and, uh, and audit on that, uh, which actually would then give more freedom within the sector to deliver care differently in different hourly rates uh, than we currently have. That's something at Cornerstone we're trying to influence, but uh, our, our commissioning partners are still very stuck on, on what that hour of care looks like. And I think when you said automation, I don't, we're not going to have robot care assistants or anything, uh, but it is about roundabout technology and where technology might replace a human intervention uh, in monitoring people. And that will be quite over the next few years uh, how it will change uh, but people still need humans to look after them but uh, you know people will no longer get care 24 hours a day it gets less and less so it'll be how else can you monitor and support people when there's not an actual person in the room to deliver that support Torsten um, so just briefly on these on these issues I mean on social care I agree with everything you just said they, um, although there are some robots in social care there's a ro there's a robot called Paro which is a robot seal used in Japan the, um, I, I use care in the loosest possible terms. You can cuddle it. Um, I think it does some things. But anyway, but there are robots in the care um, uh, sector. We've had some of them over for events. The, um, so the, and if you, if Japan really doesn't want migration, so they've got some robots doing bits of the care uh, work instead. So you can if you want to. You may well choose not to. Um, then um, on retail productivity, actually, since you've asked about it, retail productivity is growing really fast because it's a shrinking sector. If you want productivity growth, one way to get it is to shrink your sector really fast relative to the population. So I think retail's probably had the single fastest major sector of productivity growth since the financial crisis. Like everyone says, oh, the problem is we're not, the like low paying sectors aren't seeing productivity growth and the high tech financial services ones are seeing productivity growth. That is true long term, is not at all true recently. The financial services sector, zero productivity growth, pharmaceuticals, zero. The last few years are all about the big firms being rubbish. Some of the smaller sectors actually be doing better and retail is the best example now on your but i'm slightly worried we're missing your like core question which is like what what does the kind of shape volume nature of earnings growth do to the public finances and what does it mean for scotland <laughs> right so well so i've got a really unhelpful answer which is and this is there's a real lesson from income tax figures last year in, in a, a uk level which will be important for scotland which is how do you get higher income tax revenues um three ways um, apart from putting up taxes, which will leave politicians to take decisions on. But there are one, uh, more employment. Uh, and Scotland had a pretty good year on employment last year. Still not, still below in relative terms where it was pre-crisis, where it was well ahead of the UK average. But, but, but um, second, so employment. Secondly, earnings growth, just in general, having a bit more of it. And the last few years have been very bad. My view is the reason they're being bad right now is because of the weak uh, economic growth in 2015 and 2016 which was a kind of sweet spot for the UK as a whole, but not for Scotland. The, um, now we're just seeing, as I said, rubbish for everyone. And, but then the third, which is really important and understated in our income tax system, is more unequal pay. If you want higher income tax revenues, then get pay growth for the top. And because of the, progressive, the increasingly progressive nature, in brackets, of our income tax system, not of our tax system. Everyone says, oh, the rich pay all the tax nowadays. That is not true. What they mean is the rich pay all the income tax nowadays. And the reason they pay all the income tax is because they've got all the money. But, the, um, but, the, but the, if you look at what is happening to income tax revenues at the moment, the reason they are overachieving all of our expectations is because earnings growth in the last... 18 months to two years has flipped from being progressive and it's still progressive on an hourly basis to being regressive on a weekly basis and insofar as I then we're then into data problems for looking at Scotland itself just because we don't have as much data it's jumpier looking at smaller subparts but it doesn't look like Scotland is having as unequal pay growth as the UK as a whole in the last few years so it's not just that you will have weaker income tax revenues because earnings growth has been slightly lower it is that if you continue to have better earnings growth because it's fairer you will also have weaker income tax revenues in the next, I've not and I never hear that discussed at all but that is probably more important right now than the other stuff David I think Torsten's pretty much covered what I was going to say but um, Going back to the care uh, uh, sector, certainly there's um, <clears throat> experiments with uh, technology and technology will be playing an important role. And, and it, it, it's also important to, to remember that this may intersect with the Scottish Government prevention agenda. So actually, um, um, in a sense, picking up on Torsten's point about having less of something 
if we're monitoring uh, people with, with technology, not, not necessarily intrusive technology, but for example, preventing falls, which is particularly important for, for, for frail el elderly women, um, you then end up in a situation where uh, they need less care over their lifetime. It's the share of care over their lifetime that, that matters, which releases resources to be used in other ways. Uh, so you wouldn't need uh, so many carers if you manage to get this prevention technology uh, working effectively. So uh, there are ways that, that, that technology can sort of indirectly affect um, uh, productivity without necessarily needing robots looking after people. And, and the point about the income distribution is, is exactly right. It's, it seems to me, I mean, like it or like it not, we have a very unequal uh, income distribution and the people at, at the top tend to pay a lot of the income tax. Um, we are nevertheless less unequal than, than the rest of the UK is. Uh, and looking at the difference in average earnings between Scotland and the rest of the UK doesn't really give you a great indication of how income tax revenues are concerned because people at the average aren't going to pay that much income tax. It's, it, it's, the, it's the high earners who will contribute a lot of the uh, 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 overall revenue. Helen? I think it's true what you're saying. It's certainly true that you're saying about um, high earners paying high levels of income tax. Um, I don't think that that is a reason to prioritise income inequality as a, as a key policy outcome. And instead, I would much rather go back to looking at how it is that you move people up the pay spectrum and how it is that um, low-paid workers become middle-paid workers, become high-paid workers, rather than simply looking, thinking of it very straightforwardly as how do we how do we recoup the highest level of um, of, ta of tax by increasing the the highest earners. Russell, so, um, of course, uh, a, a sort of short term way of boosting productivity would be to cut workers and carry on producing the same amount, but that would be a short term road to probably long term ruin. Um, a much more sustainable way of increasing productivity would be um, investing in the things that help your workers to be uh, more productive. So whether that's management, whether that's skills, whether that's new technologies that help them to do so. So in retail, and sorry, the, the other point is that productivity growth may not find its way into pay growth um, at all. So you need to potentially intervene to make sure that happens. So retail has grown in productivity, but that has not led to pay increases for those at the low end necessarily. Um, so what can we do there? It's not just getting the productivity growth, it's making sure that that finds its way into pay growth. Um, the second point around, so it's absolutely true, again, short term, long term, absolutely true that in the short term, you could uh, bring in large amounts of income tax revenue by boosting high pay. But we also know, and it's underpinning the whole inclusive growth agenda, that um, a fairer economy is a stronger economy. So yes, in the short term, you might be able to sustain increasing tax revenues that way, but in the long term, you're going to undermine the strength of your economy. So in that long term, it's much more sustainable to be trying to boost lower paid, medium paid workers and boosting career progression through doing so, because you're much more likely to get a more sustainable growth, even if that sacrifices to some extent tax revenue increases in the short term. Can somebody help me with a quandary here? Because I've heard others talking about how automation can help improve productivity. Effectively, that means less labour. Uh, 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 maybe the labour's doing something different. But, but if, we've, if, if effectively automation, it, it, it becomes more of a... If we see that as a, as a measure to increase productivity, potentially it means less people in the economy paying tax, does it not, though? And so is there not a quandary there? Or have I... If, if there isn't, sort me out, please. There's a, an economist or two around the table. That I'll, I'll give it a go, and then I think David can correct me. But, um, but in essence, so it's a short-term, long-term again. So if you can find uh, productivity increases over the long term, they should recycle back into employment growth because your economy can grow. And if you get it right into pay growth in the short term, you may see an impact on employment levels, yes. Um, unless, again, you can manage that well through intervention. So, for example, a skills system that can broker 
opportunities between those contracting sectors and those expanding sectors in a way that we don't necessarily do just now. But in the long run, productivity increases, if managed well, including through automation, should lead to pay increases, employment growth, economic growth. Well, the, um, history, the lessons from history suggest that, you know, the previous waves of automation have not damaged uh, employment levels in, in, in the UK and there's a, a strong debate uh, around what the effect of the, the latest, the fourth industrial revolution uh, is, uh, is going to have. Um, there are some who are quite optimistic that other jobs will be found. And these are the jobs that will emphasize uh, uh, soft skills uh, that can't be replicated um, uh, easily. Um, um, others argue that what we're going to see is a globalization of services. So we've seen a globalization of the market, uh, sorry, of manufacturing in the last 30 years or so. And um, there is argument that, that, that we're going to see many of our services now being up to uh, uh, international competition. I don't know what the, where that's going. I don't think anybody really knows uh, how that's going to develop, but I do think that we haven't discussed it enough uh, where that may be, you know, these uh, developments are really um, close to happening now in certain parts of the world and Scotland hasn't really been talking about it. Angela, is there any out of that that you need to, in terms of your initial starting question, you want to come back to? Oh, I think there's something in all of that for everyone. <laughs> there's no other questions you want to do with that, that's what I'm really meaning. Okay, has anyone else got any other contribution in that area? If not, we'll move on to the next area, which is um, a changes in the labour market and impacts on earnings. And Patrick, although we've covered some of that already. Um, I mean, Thanks, Camina. Several people have, have touched on some aspects of this, particularly around things like uh, you know, automation and casualisation, which uh, will affect the, the labour market. But there's also uh, a contrast between some of the, the stats that get trumpeted around you know, highest ever employment, lowest ever unemployment, compared with people's lived reality around low pay, precarious work, insecure or, or temperamental uh, you know, variable income. That they can't rely on. Um, other changes that are coming in as well, some of the, 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 the written submissions that we've had talk about the, the changing balance between full and part-time work and, and whether there's a, a change in the gender pattern of that. Uh, as well as that, we, we have to acknowledge the possibility, at least perhaps the strong possibility, that freedom of movement will be choked off and that that will impact on the labour market as well. So of, of these changes and others in the labour market, uh, what are the most significant that are already impacting on earnings and how do people around the table see that going forward? What are the, the things that we need to be looking to in terms of changes in the labour market that we might anticipate? Torsten. Um, that's a great question. So, the, um, so just like by way of history, first of all, so the, the big picture of Scottish pay, before we get on to what's happening right now, is of um, continued growth in the 2000s while everybody else slowed. So Scotland's pay catch-up is a function of the back half of the 2000s. So every, the UK as a whole, growth, pay growth starts slowing in around 2003. No one really notices. Scotland bucks that trend. Scotland's labour market has a really strong phase through 2005, 6, 7, uh, and goes into the crisis with higher employment uh, and typical pay having more or less caught up with the UK average. The, um, it then has a slightly less extreme pay squeeze, so slightly worse employment effect during the crisis, but slightly shallower pay squeeze, particularly for the private sector. Um, meaning you have a general, again, a further narrowing of the gap. So Scotland does it well during a bad phase for everybody. And as we've then discussed, we've had a worse phase more recently on the aggregate level. Then the question is, what is kind of going on in different phases to give you the things and what is the how do we how do we square this circle which is the numbers show you record employment but people are set, pissed off yeah which is the less polite version of what you're saying which is why do we keep hearing about insecure work low pay but everyone's saying everything's going really well on the aggregate data and i think the answer is more nuanced than both sides say okay so 
I think people should be really careful in saying, oh, all this extra employment, it's all bad, low-quality jobs. I don't think the data stacks that up, and I also think it's really patronising to people doing those jobs. And if you look at who has benefited most from the fact that employment is, has increased significantly more than any of us thought was possible, it has disproportionately gone to lower income, income not earnings, lower income households, so, which is not always true. So in the late 90s, the increase in employment went to second earners in higher income households. That has not happened this time. So it's a progressive employment growth. It's gone to women, the disabled, low qualified, particularly in Scotland where you have a too high a level of disabled employment. You want that to be happening. So, uh, so be careful about saying that's all bad. Now, then the issue is, have some of the people that have come into the labour market, are they doing lower paid jobs, the ones that were previously out of the labour market? So the answer is yes. Okay. Does that mean that the jobs in the economy are on average worse than they were before? No. And the reason is because people, other people that are in the labour market are moving up the occupational distribution at the same time. So it is not true when everyone says there's loads more low paid jobs than there were before. That is not true. And when people say, oh, you know, everyone says, oh, the labour market's being hollowed out, there are only bad jobs at the bottom, good jobs at the top, and there's no jobs left in the middle. For the population as a whole, that is not true, okay, in, the, uh, in Scotland or in the UK, that is not true. There is, there is a, at the bottom, there is growth in social and caring jobs, driving some growth, but most of the other occupations are shrinking. Uh, and the top, in general, you've got, more t you've got more public sector workers, more qualified, more professionals, growing reasonably fast, but it's just different people moving through it. Don't think about it in static terms. Right. Then where is the bad news? The bad news, why is everyone pissed off? Okay. The reason, the fundamental reason, is because earnings have been really bad in a way that none of us thought was possible for most of the income distribution in the UK since 2003 and in Scotland since the financial crisis. And they have stayed low, they fell and they've stayed low, and we are failing to get them going again. And the reason we are not getting them going again now is productivity. In 2016, it was due to higher inflation driven by the exchange rate going through the floor and a similar thing happening in the middle of the financial crisis. That's why I don't... Um, that is the fundamental... Well, why is Britain's pay squeeze so much worse than everybody else's around the world? Because of inflation being slightly higher. Why was inflation slightly higher? Because of sterling going through the floor. I mean, it's, re it's ridiculous looking back on it. Nobody in 2009 noticed the fact that we were seeing a bigger sterling depreciation than we saw in 1992, when it was all we talked about forever. That drove an inflation spike push down real wages, and we have never recovered from that. And the reason we're not now recovering, even though we've now got back to full-ish employment, is because of things. So, so uh, then where is the other things to be pissed off about? <laughs> yeah. um, higher in secure work than we had pre-crisis, slightly, although Scotland are not as bad as other parts of the UK. People in uh, shorter hours than they would like, although be careful, because actually, so Scotland saw a slightly faster fall in hours worked as the financial crisis hit. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is, but slightly faster fall. The, um, um, but then has broadly mirrored the rest of the UK, which is basically, it's just flat. Hours stop. But remember, the history is hours worked falling, yeah? As countries become richer, we reduce the hours we work. That's true in Scotland and the UK for the whole, for the whole of the 20th century, it's falling. Since the financial crisis, people have stopped reducing their hours worked. Why are they doing that? because their pay has been hit and they're trying to protect their incomes by wanting to work more hours than they would otherwise have wanted to work. And if you, and, we, and that's a very good thing, okay? The fact, that they can, the fact that we've messed up productivity and they can protect themselves from that by not seeing their incomes fall by as much, by working slightly more hours is a good thing. They, um, but it is driving some, it is then leading to more people wanting more hours than they can get in the current economy. I appreciate it. I to paint a mixed picture, but I, I, I would just pick up on that, that last point. It, it, it may be arguable that there are some some benefits to the economy from that change, but it's it's surely not a good thing for those individuals if they're having to work more hours just in order to not even stay still. But what is, but what is the counterfactual? Terms. Okay, so is it a good? Thing? Would we all like to have to work less hours? It turns out that history tells us the human's answer to that is yes. We would, as as the as we get more productive, we would like to work marginally shorter hours. They are not quite as much as Keynes thought, but like a bit. But that isn't the counterfactual. The counterfactual is, if hourly pay growth slows, is it a good thing that a flexible labour market allows us some scope 
to change that preference to protect our incomes. So it's not they are p people are better off than they would otherwise be well, if they had some to reduce their that, that scope. But it, it yeah. clearly doesn't allow all people that scope. And the yeah. the, 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 the fact true. that we still have high levels of in work poverty at the same time as high levels of employment surely suggests that the the argument that work is the route out of poverty is, is a broken argument now. So, well, I totally agree with that. Right. Right, okay. Look, look, thank you, Torsten. That was very helpful in giving us that picture. If we get some other people in. John. Well, working is a euphemism for people working at strange parts of the day where historically you might have got enhanced hourly rates. So evenings, weekends, Sundays for basic uh, minimum hourly rates, which historically, obviously, even in inverted commas, good public sector jobs wasn't the case. There isn't a single local authority in Scotland where you get double time for working overtime on a Sunday, for example. So even in mainstream employers, conditions of service beyond the early rate have deteriorated rapidly in the last 10 years or so. I mean, there are more families in work where seven out of 10 children who live in poverty, at least one parent is working. So people are working flexibly and more hours because they're desperate to balance their, 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 their domestic incomes and employers in various sectors will take advantage of that. There's the sleepover issue that you've probably covered before in the social care sector, which doesn't even meet in certain places uh, minimum wage, let alone living wage. So um, part-time work is n not being done because it's, it's quality work that people uh, are choosing for lifestyle reasons. It's really for economic reasons. And they're moving up through quality jobs, through upskilling, education and training, moving into higher levels of jobs, up through the nursing, up through the nursing sector, up through the social work profession, out of uh, menial jobs into minimal, minimal middle jobs, is, relies on staff training. It relies on employers skilling up the staff. It relies on the college sector delivering part-time and block release courses. And the, the first budgets that went in the, in the austerity period have been the training budgets. There are very few employers investing in their staff Although at the same time they're saying for demographic reasons we need to grow our own, etc. I mean, I'm lead for the further education sector and we're pursuing a dialogue about introducing training schemes at a national level uh, in the college sector. I had some discussions with Angela in the past, but even the sector that delivers skills in education is not very good at skilling up its own staff. So if you want to go from being a, a janitor to an ICT technician, then it's very, very difficult. David and then Helen. Just add a little bit uh, of nuance <clears throat> to what's already been said. Um, so the idea of uh, people wanting to work more hours than, than they're currently being offered is, is, is the notion of underemployment. And I've written quite a lot about that with my colleague, Danny Blanchflower. And it's certainly the case that although unemployment is at a pretty historic low, uh, lower than uh, it's been since the 1970s, there still is uh, more underemployment than there was prior to the recession. Um, so um, we've also done some work on the well-being of people in different um, employment states, and it is certainly the case that the underemployed, uh, their level of well-being is less than those who are fully employed, but then their level of well-being is better than those who are unemployed. So there's a kind of trade-off here. What, uh, what, what, what is the more desirable uh, uh, situation? And then in relation to John's um, point, I've, with a different colleague, I've been tracing the decline in paid overtime working uh, since the beginning of this century, and it's certainly the case that um, the use of paid overtime has declined pretty sharply. Of course, that interacts with the minimum wage too. So people may be offered the minimum wage, but the, the counterbalance to that is that they're offered a lower premium or less overtime hours. Uh, so um, that's one of the big changes that people are being asked to do, um, non, what you might consider non-standard hours, but for no more than the basic rate. Thank you. Ella. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's quite striking when you sort of 
talk directly to workers and when you sort of look at what workers are raising as a concern across different workplaces and in different sectors is how much mental health and stress and job intensity is consistently raised as an issue across sectors and across workplaces and it seems that you know the demand from union reps for mental health first aid courses the demand for sort of suicide prevention is very very high and from the point of view of someone who talks, who spends a lot of time trying to service the needs of, of workers across the economy, that is something that we are having to look at more and more, and it's something that occupational health systems are having to look at more and more, and I think it's an element of this that can get lost because it doesn't show up in pay figures, it doesn't necessarily show up in, in uh, very easily in, in questions about um, how people find work, but yet it is a it is a scarring feature of of the workplace across Scotland, and I think when you're thinking thinking about productivity and you're thinking about how we raise productivity, the fact that we've got a workforce that is overstretched, that feels that they aren't being supported by the employer, they're not necessarily being offered training, they feel all the time that they're running on empty, how are you supposed to see productivity gains? You know, this should be about you know, job design, it should be about you know, supporting the workforce in a real way and when you're having that level of stress and mental health crisis, it's just simply untenable. Oh boy. Uh. Thanks. Um, I think just to go back to the point again that because women um, make up the majority of low paid workers that uh, again that their experiences of insecure temporary and zero hour contracts are, are greater so disproportionately they're more likely to be on um, these type of contracts. Um, and I think we can't look at that without considering part-time work, such as Patrick's question, which framed that as well. So women make up the majority of part-time workers, but part-time work is predominantly found in um, low-paid jobs and sectors. And I think that goes back to the point that there's a cultural presumption very often across many organisations and in sectors that part-time working isn't suitable for higher-paid jobs. And so that in itself sustains women's concentration in lower-paid work. Um, and so there is a, the problem, as David said, about underemployment, but also that many women are working below their um, their skill level in jobs that they're just essentially in the wrong jobs and so could be working at a much higher level. Um, and to, um, I think Helen and both John had mentioned the problem with um, training and the lack of training. And um, certainly we found that in our own work that um, women tell us that they um, have challenges as in accessing um, in-work training, which prevents them from progressing into higher paid work. But also women are less likely to be able to access training as a whole. And low paid part-time working are the um, women are the group of workers that are least likely to access training in the labour market. Yeah, I was going to go back to a point that John made, and it's, it's about trying to make, uh, you know, we're trying to influence, um, you know, the different sectors in low pay. One of the things that uh, happened recently, you know, it's about sleepovers, is it's now Scottish Government policies, you know, for sleepover hours to be paid at the same rate as, as daytime hours. Again, why wouldn't you disagree with that? But the reality is, uh, for organisations like us, where the majority of the work we do is commissioned by, by local authorities and partnerships, is that they don't have resources to pay for people to be asleep at night for the same rate as they are during the day. So on one hand, Scottish living wage, ring fence, fantastic, so our frontline staff get a boost in pay. On the other hand, all the local authorities are now taking away all the sleepovers at night. So where our staff used to top up their income by doing three or four sleepovers a month, that's been taken away. So that, that Scottish living wage has lift their bit of their salary then it's being taken away so they end up in the same position. So if it's not thought through properly, if there's not enough consultation with the sector about potential implications, uh, that's exactly what happens. So something very well-meaning then has the opposite effect. Russell. I think, so to step back, you would usually expect when employment rates are at record levels, that to put pressure in terms of increasing wages. And that would usually, all economic theory, certainly past experience, would suggest that that would happen, but it's not happening now. Um, now, we touched on productivity quite well, <clears throat> and that will be one aspect holding back that usual relationship from happening. But there may be other ones, and some of the obvious ones are around potentially sort of unseen slack in the economy, if you like. So whilst it looks like employment's very high, um, there are people that are either underemployed, that are in insecure work, or indeed some of the economically inactive people that are neither counted as employed or unemployed are beginning to come back into the labour market keeping wages down. 
So out of those, self-employment is one to touch on. So we've, we're, we currently have close to record levels of self-employment in the economy. Data on earnings for self-employed is very difficult, but from what you can see, across the UK at least, there's been a huge reduction in uh, profits, as it were, wages for self-employed since the crash across the UK. It's about 25%. So either the people that were already in, in self-employment have seen a reduction or the new entrants into self-employment are at a very low um, level. And within that, we're seeing increasing proportion of self-employed that are women. So you can see that part of the picture here may be that we're counting people as employed when in actual fact they're in low quality. Uh, to take, by all means, Torsten's point from earlier, there are pockets of low quality insecure work out there. Um, another one would be around young people. So we've done some work earlier this year looking at, from the skill system point of view, the number of young people coming out of the skill system into positive destinations that may be no such thing um, from our point of view. So we've got 90 odd percent positive destinations, but actually one in seven young people in Scotland, just over that, were employed in insecure work. Now, we may be missing a damage, so at the last recession it was unemployment and the scarring effect that that had on young people and beyond. At this recession and recovery that we're still in, we may be missing that uh, insecure work could be having a scarring effect on future careers um, and on productivity and on pay and on the future strength of the economy too. So just to add to what's been discussed um, around self-employment and around insecure work for young people. Thank you. Tors? But just to pick up directly on that point, I think we should be really careful about saying that um, a tight labour market is not feeding through to pay growth. So that is not true. That's not what the econometric evidence shows. It does feed through to it. It just can't get to going very fast because there's not a lot of productivity growth to then feed through into pay growth. It's not true that if you get a tight labour market and some productivity growth, it won't lead to pay growth. That's not what the evidence shows. It shows that we haven't got any productivity growth, so you're not getting it happening. And it's, and it's really important because otherwise you end up saying things like there's no point getting the productivity growth in the first place because it won't feed through. So be careful on what the evidence shows on um, that. On I was wanted to join up Patrick's initial question actually to think I agree with what Anna was saying, which is on look, why are we talking about lots of these um, uh, lower paid and part time and short hours jobs in a way we should have been but weren't in the 2000s? And the answer is now because lots more men are doing them. So everyone suddenly decides we should talk about it all the time. Now, the big picture of low paid, low qualified work is that women have done, do a, still do a hugely disproportionate volume of it, the, um, but the increase is all men and the decrease is women. So the, the, the levels are high for women, but the change is for men going into those roles and for women coming out of them as, as you get a general occupational upgrading for women over time. And the, I think that probably is a large part of why we started talking about it for the reasons you raise about structural people's attitudes to um, work and other things. The, um, but, that, but it is important that, that that is driving quite a lot of the wider changes you're then seeing in the aggregate wage data. So, like what, so what is pushing up on... Uh, earnings inequality is one of the things at the moment is not that the highest paid in Scotland are getting particularly high wage rises it's that lower paid men are seeing hours reductions relative to where they were kind of 10 15 years ago um what and, and higher paid men are not and so you're getting a kind of you're getting an inequality of hours increasing whereas traditionally lower paid working class men did the longest hours in the economy because they were support they were supported a family by doing kind of 50 hours they were being paid overtime for doing it that was the kind of structure of the economy we're moving away from that and have been for some time but and and, it, and it's those people that are really angry so you do focus groups or qualitative work who is most kind of not happy with the world of work as it exists even though women are doing most of the low paid local low um valued work wrongly the um the men that are didn't see their parents do it their dad do it and didn't expect it to happen and you, i mean and it's very large like the share of men doing so the share of low paid work uh being done by men i think is up about 45 percent since the uh, turn of the century so these are big changes they're big social changes they're not just about the economy and that how we wrestle with that and, and, and it's hard because you want it's a good thing you want a better gender sharing of low paid work we like less low paid work overall but if we're measuring it relative to the median then it's not going down it's just like a kind of average thing to some degree then you want it to be gender shared but you are you're run, we're, our counteract to that is causing a lot of discontent and that is where that's where these things are hard the um on specifically i mean we'll probably come on to the gender pay gap but that 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 leaves then 
that process needs to continue. But that issue, which feeds into our point, which is where do we see ongoing large gender pay gaps coming in, as, which is basically now when you have kids, um, because of the forcing into part-time and then the staying put in part-time because of the lack of flexibility for higher paid roles, that is the dominant factor that we have no adequate policy response for as yet. But hours, just a general thing, paying pay, pay more attention on hours worked, who is working what hours, to understand what is happening to your country is a really thing worth doing. Like everyone only looks at the income levels because everyone thinks, oh, everyone in this world gets a salary, yeah? So they don't think about hours worked in the same way, but hours worked are crucial to understanding how income distributions change over time. I see. Um, David, then, then I'm gonna move on. Sorry, and then I'll come to Emma, and then we'll move on to the, the final area. Just to um, uh, uh, Russell's point about self-employment is, is, is an important one. It's, it's important for Scotland's tax revenues too because we're now up to around 14% of uh, the workforce are self-employed and in the growth in that has, has largely been amongst self-employed who don't employ anybody else. So they're working on their own account and they're typically earning very little. So the, 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 the spread of the uh, income distribution of the self-employed is wider than the spread of the income distribution of the employed. There are some who, who do very well, but uh, also many who do pretty badly. Um, of course, they have no form of representation because they're, they're, they're working on uh, uh, their own behalf. And some of the work we've been doing recently without coming to any conclusion at all is to try to understand why self-employment has been growing so much faster uh, in the UK, whereas in the States it's falling. Uh, so two countries that apparently have very high employment, very low unemployment, but completely different trends in, in self-employment. What is it about the UK that makes self-employment seem like uh, uh, an attractive option? Just a, a one... Um, uh, unrelated point, but but it's come up quite often, uh, it relates to training and some of the discussion uh, in the UK around um, lack of productivity growth has been about uh, management quality, uh, management quality um, compared to uh, our our competitor countries. That's something that uh, we need to give some uh, attention to, I think, as well in Scotland. But, I mean, one of the ways that we see that is lack of training uh, for employees. Okay. Emma, good, I'm about to move on. But yep. yep, thank you very much, convener, and thanks everybody for your uh, input so far. Torsten, you mentioned about uh, the depreciation of the pound. So there was one statistic I read, it's been 18% reduced since uh, the June 23rd EU referendum. But I'm interested in the care sector as well as the agricultural sector, and Helen, you mentioned that as well. Um, we are seeing people not coming from the EU because the pound isn't as valuable as it was, so especially in the dairy sector. So I'm interested if there is evidence of people not coming to work in care or in the dairy sector, milking cows, 48% of Scotland's dairy farms are in the southwest. So is there evidence emerging that the agricultural workers are not coming here and that they're going to France and Germany where it's euro for euro but better pay? Dorsen, then I'll come to Hazel um, to talk about the... I don't think I can give you a definitive answer to that because the data doesn't let us... Yeah, we've all heard... You will all have heard all the anecdotal evidence of... Um, uh, employers saying it's a disaster, I can't hire anyone at the moment, and saying, now, what can we see in the migration data? Um, so we, we are, we've definitely seen a change in behaviour since the referendum. We've seen um, uh, decreases in people coming here from um, the accession countries, and we've seen increases in people leaving from older bits of so Western Europe, mm. the original EU 15. In terms of what is driving it, though, I think it's more complicated. So the pound is definitely part of it. That makes sense. If people were coming for a temporary to do a job for a year, it's definitely less worth doing that. I wouldn't underestimate, though, like, you know, wages in Poland have been growing very fast over the last five years, and that is a big part of what is going on. And, the, you know, the worst of the euro crisis is over. So the alternative labour markets out there have... Um, changed very fundamentally. Plus, we've kind of, you know, 
sent a message out that we were less keen than we were. So it's not massively surprising that on a human level, people take different lifestyle decisions and you all know people that have made versions of those decisions. But have, is there very good evidence that distinguishes between those different effects and says this much is because of a stronger economy in bits of Europe, this much is because of the depreciation, and this much is because of um, attitudinal issues? No. And I would warn slightly against saying it's all depreciation because the depreciation in 2009 was bigger than the depreciation post-Brexit, but that after that we saw a surge in migration from the EU, uh, and we're now seeing the opposite. So I think it's definitely part of it, um, and it, particularly for people who, who are short-term migrants, it's got to be a, where they're clearly coming to send the money back rather than making a bigger choice about their life. Um, but I don't think we could say it's the... Um, the whole part. And I'd also just as a, just a general word of warning, which is because this whole debate is, because basically the migration debate is now seen totally through the lens of Brexit. So if you're pro Brexit, then you're like, the migrants were causing all the problems beforehand. And then if you're anti Brexit, you're saying like, any fall in migration is a complete disaster and the economy goes off a cliff immediately. Both those positions are totally not backed up by the economic evidence. They're both politicised positions. They may hold them for other reasons. You want migration for what it does to your society, more open feel, you want the opposite. But on the economics, it doesn't. Like Employers will always say to you, I can't get the staff I need. And the first thing I always say to them is, have you increased your wages? <laughs> like, Have you tried this bold thing, offering a pay rise to see if anyone comes to work for you? And the answer is always, oh, no, 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 no. So, the, um, so that is why like, employers are not independent people to tell you what they have to have in terms of migration policy is all I'm saying. They're not, these people have a slight vested interest in the situation, but the numbers are down for some combination of those three reasons, and I have no idea what the balance between the three is. These are here. Yeah, I mean, for us as an organisation, I have to say we haven't noticed any difference, but that's a type of organisation we are in terms of we provide a lot of support in the community in people's own homes, um, and I don't actually have access to the data, but I suspect if you went and talked to Scottish Care, uh, who, who uh, represent a lot of the care home providers, I, I suspect they would have seen uh, a change in kind of EU nationals and things coming over, but I don't have that data, but they would be the people probably who could tell you that. Ellen? because Torsten has kind of anticipated me a little bit. I mean, I think the question is more about what happens next. Um, and we would argue very strongly that this is an opportunity to start looking at these low-wage sectors that have relied too heavily on migrant labour and looking at job quality and job design and pay. And we would put it back to the employer quite strongly, as Torsten just did, and say, this is, you know, if you can't attract skilled workers, then you have to ask yourself a serious question about why that is. And um, we simply don't accept an answer that says that the only way you can run a business is to run it on very low wages and, and, and migration. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move on uh, to, to our last theme um, on distribution of earnings and implications for revenue. And Adam Tompkins is going to help facilitate the beginning of that. Thank, thank you, Kavina. We've covered some of this ground, ground already, but I, I want to focus particularly on the distribution of earnings in Scotland and the implications for revenues that accrue to the Scottish Government, uh, which means principally income tax rather than um, national insurance. So I want to focus mainly on employment rather than on self-employment, just um, because of the current distribution of devolved um, taxation. And I want just to look at both ends of this, high, high paid and low paid. Perhaps we can start with the low paid. Um, and as this committee reported in its most recent report on um, uh, the Scottish Government's budget, um, in a country of, what, about 5.4 million people, there are 2 million people in Scotland who don't pay any income tax at all. Is that desirable? And is it sustainable? And if it is neither desirable nor sustainable, what should be done about it? Do it. Well, we, we have quite a strange um, structure because you can't really think of income tax separate from national, national insurance. So national insurance kicks in earlier than, the, than income tax does, which is about 10 point something thousand now. So um, there, it seems to me there, there has always been an argument, although civil servants suggest it's a very difficult uh, thing to carry out uh, for amalgamating national insurance and income tax. And of course, that is now rendered more difficult by the devolution settlement. Um, so you, you, the, you end up with a, with a kind of profile of, of um, national insurance and income tax rates when you combine them, which looks 
str quite strange. It doesn't certainly doesn't look smooth, and in fact, the the um, changes to the allowances, the ta the high rate allowance, or the lack of change to the high rate allowance, in fact, has has produced an unusual spike in uh, in income tax stroke national insurance. Um, uh, recently, I, so it, I mean, it, it seems to me there's an argument um, that by not combining uh, these two taxes, uh, you end up in a situation of, of great difficulty, which will, I think, cause tensions as far as the devolution settlement uh, is concerned. Whether uh, one can go, you know, to to uh, Scotland having the power over national insurance uh, uh, would remain to be decided by politicians. But um, certainly, compared with other countries, we do have a very high personal allowance. Um, that is not something over which the Scottish government uh, ha has any control. Um, does it does it hugely affect work incentives? I don't think we know. We really know the answer uh, to that uh, at the moment, but um, it's certainly worth uh, 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 further consideration. But it has to be done in in, in considerate in uh, conjunction with national insurance, because I don't think at the end of the day people, in, in terms of their pay packet, may make uh, the distinction very. It's not very clear to them. Russell? Yeah, I think, so is it sustainable and is it desirable? I think the desirable question comes down to what you're attempting to achieve, of course. So if we're attempting to reduce child poverty down to the levels that we've all in this room pledged to do by 2030, um, for example, in, increasing tax um, down at, income tax down at the, the bottom end may well be counter to that. Um, and, and is it desirable? Um, at the same time as a universal credit taper will be impacting a great deal of people down at that lower end to tax on top of that taper, so it can reach 75p in the pound. And if we think 46p in the pound is causing problems for work incentives at the top end, then surely 75p in the pound is doing so at the bottom end. So desirability comes down to a judgment call as to what you're hoping to achieve, I, I would argue. Um, and again, uh, the personal allowance, it's a function in essence of a UK-wide decision to remove many, many people out of income tax as a way to, well, supposedly, is that if that's not too judgmental a word, to supposedly be progressive, when in actual fact it will benefit nobody underneath the personal allowance as it stands. So it's a big, big, um, costly, I think 110, 120 billion pounds a year across the UK spend most of which doesn't go to the very, very poorest, at least. So, you know, that desirability question comes down to where you stand and what you're trying to achieve. The sustainability question, I think, is an interesting one. Across the whole of the economy, across the whole of the tax system, and I think Torsten referred to this earlier, we don't particularly have a progressive tax system. We have a very progressive, in inverted commas, um, as in, in technical terms, income tax system. And that Therefore, in Scotland, is leading to a big dependence, which we'll no doubt come onto, onto higher rate and additional rate earners, a very small number of them. So one solution to that, we'll get onto the higher end, but one solution to that at the low end is to focus very much on people that are in work, on minimum wage, and pushing them much closer to median wage. And that would have some implications for your skill system, for example, focusing on those in work and those that are low paid and secure work. That would have implications for your productivity and your economic strategy, which we've touched on. So focusing on those parts of the economy that are minimum wage and trying to get people up in terms of their pay from there. So your sustainability question, um, I think, is a bit more cut and dried. And some of the responses to that, at the low end at least, are about boosting pay, which in turn will deliver that inclusive growth that we all uh, suggest we wish to see. John. A lot of in-work poverty. We are still working with the Child Poverty Action Group producing reports like this about uh, fair work and decent childhood. So, short anecdote of a recent development doesn't answer your question, but none of the local authorities have consolidated the living wage into their own pay structure. So, £9 an hour isn't the substantive least you can earn within a local authority. So, there are a lot of local authority workers who received the recent pay deal, 3.5%, not an astronomical amount of money. 
but where universal credit's in place, when they got their back pay to the 1st of April 18, they lost their benefits. They were then put into a reassessment, which meant that their actual household income reduced despite the 3.5% increase because DWP counted the back pay as earnings in that one month. So in terms of the balance between tax and benefits and salary, something's going wrong here. Uh, because at that level, a pay rise is actually punishing you in terms of your household income. Would constituents contact me specifically about that? Anna? Uh, yeah, and just to follow on from John's point there, um, and obviously as Unison represents the public sector, presumably you're talking about the majority um, women workers within yeah, that absolutely. group as well, because it really is hard to overstate the impact of social security and so-called welfare reform, the impact on women's incomes. So the reason, one of the reasons why women are um, um, so overrepresented among the lower paid jobs is because of that greater reliance on social security, both because they're in low paid jobs, but also because they um, do shoulder the, the burden of unpaid care, both for adults and for children. And so um, it, it's um, really critical to take a, a gendered approach to even thinking about um, um, income tax and exactly in considering women's position in the labour market. Dorsen. Um, so on, on your question, so the, um, is it it, my, my, our view is that it is not desirable to have as high a personal allowance as we have. Our, our, our reason for that is that, um, that it has been very, very expensive to achieve, like very, very expensive, like £10 billion, and that that has disproportionately benefited higher earners, particularly the most recent increases in the personal allowance. The, um, there are also other arguments for that position, which the Resolution Foundation wouldn't take institutionally, but, you know, what you believe about a stakeholder society, how you want that to feel. The, um, the, all I would say is over time, uh, income tax historically, you know, pre-war wasn't paid by a majority of the population. Instead, inheritance tax was. We've now hilariously gone to the opposite extremes and then started coming back the way on income tax. So societies take different decisions at different times. And, and, it's, and we should be really clear, clear that we are taxing the income of people, even if they're not paying income tax. The, um, but I think for the, I would say for the... For, for, Scottish politicians, I do think it is a, the fact that you have ended up with a tax base. So overall, is it desirable to have an income tax base that is potentially, not certainly, but potentially more volatile? That is undesirable from a kind of fiscal perspective, all else equal, although you could compensate for it in other aspects of your tax system. But taken in, on, in isolation, I think that is undesirable. It doesn't mean it will always be more volatile. You could imagine a system that low earners happen to have, suddenly have very volatile earnings, but that's less likely to happen. The, um, so I think that is undesirable. And, and if your tax base is then disproportionately made up of that bit of the tax system, then clearly you've ended up with, as a byproduct of the personal allowance policy, a more volatile um, system for the tax base that supports Scottish government spending, and that is all else equal undesirable. The, um, what you do about it is hard, because you are... I support everything um, uh, others have said about in, in bringing people up nearer the median for earnings and stuff. You are not going to get very much income. Like, I, mean, you know, I don't want to be bl too blunt about it, but you're not going to get much income tax revenue from it. Okay. The, um, you know, people are... You know, large amounts of the population... I'll give you an example. Almost 40% possibly of the household income distribution is not, is not really paying much income tax at all. Could be even up to half now. The, um, instead, what's happened... And so they don't... Cuts for, all these cuts to income tax have been no use to them at all. What they're being hammered by is big cuts to benefits that are happening right now, which is why child poverty will be rising over the next few years, um, where women in particular... But women will be losing from uh, the work incentive effects of universal credit, but, but that isn't the, the big thing that is driving down incomes at the bottom third of the distribution is uh, the benefit freeze support for large families is not really it's not universal credit that's the problem it's other cuts to the social security system that are doing the work on reducing those incomes and there's nothing you can do on the tax system to compensate for that these effects are so large that they, i mean some families at the bottom will be losing over the next once these welfare cuts are rolled out fully you after if i ignore housing costs so like disposable income after you paid your rent the um, people will be losing 15 you know, percent of their disposable income from these cuts. These are like massive. So tax tweaks are kind of neither here nor there for most of those families. There is a work incentive. There is some work incentive effects, uh, but there will be work. But I wouldn't want to go the other way. So some countries are. Some people argue for no personal allowance. So they take the extreme version of my argument, which is 
it's been regressive, increasing as far as... And they say, well, let's just not have a personal allowance, let's scrap it and just have a universal basic income or something instead. I would, I would caution about having no personal allowance because for people's incentives to enter work, if you overlay, you do not want to be overlaying income tax kicking in as soon as you enter work for marginal workers you will have a you will have a particularly for women actually you will have a big work incentive effect that i would be nervous about so i think it's too high now but i wouldn't want zero um that's fascinating thank you very much i mean i think i mean obviously we are focused on on revenues but i think that the issues that you you, you raised Torsten, about the stakeholder society is, is you know they're really they're really important to, to to us as well and that you know it's, it just strikes me that we hear quite a lot about inclusive growth we don't hear so much about inclusive taxation and I wonder if that's something that we should uh, um, should think about. Can we just turn the telescope around and think about the top, the top end of the um, of, of the labour market? And we've heard a lot this morning, um, and in your um, written evidence as well, um, there was a lot about um, wage stagnation and how there has not been a very significant wage um, uh, increases over the course of the last um, ten years or more in any part of the UK, including uh, in Scotland. But if we look forward, um, and so much of what this committee does is analysing forecasts that are given to us um, by the Scottish Fiscal Commission and others and it's very important to the, to, to the way in which the fiscal framework uh, operates that we understand um, where uh, taxation is likely to go and the forecasts are um, that the notwithstanding the um, wage stagnation that we've seen over the last 10 years that the um, a number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland and the number of higher rate taxpayers in Scotland both of these numbers are, are forecast to grow very quickly over the course of the next uh, five years. So the forecast number of additional rate taxpayers, in, um, again, I'm only talking about income tax, um, it, it more than 30% increase between now and 2023. Um, and forecast number of higher rate taxpayers, nearly a 25% increase between now and 2023, notwithstanding the fact that we've seen no real wage rises over the course of the last decade. So two questions about this, what's driving these forecasts and in your experience and in your judgment and yes they are just forecasts but in your experience and your judgment how reliable are they are they likely to be <laughs> you, you, you want to have a crack at this torsion um, well the, the reason they are happening in those the reason they're appearing arithmetically in those forecasts is because of the freezing of the because because we don't uprate the thresholds particularly for the hundred that's what's driving your additional rate the 150k is um set as it were and doesn't rise with inflation and so even if even if earnings overall are only growing by like one percent above inflation if you're not even uprating the threshold by inflation then clearly you bring more people into the net and that is what has driven the increases in why are there more high so that's what additional rate but just be careful on those increased percentages are on like you know 10 people going up to 13 so the, um, there aren't lots and lots of people in the bucket but it but it's up to 20, yeah. So it's like, but so it's a big, it's a big percentage number. The absolute numbers are uh, not that large, but they're big ta matters for tax policy clearly because they pay a lot of tax. Yeah. Um, uh, on the higher rate group, which is a much larger percentage of the population, so the increase there is being driven by in the past by a policy pre 2015, which is when the personal allowance rises happened. The high rate threshold was actually sometimes cut intentionally to avoid the personal allowance benefiting feeding through to higher rate taxpayers so you and they that that, is then, that was then stopped in around 2015 we just got on with in fact we actually moved to increasing the higher rate um threshold that is now not true in scotland but it's true in the uh, uk but the and that that's what so you basically you, you you've got a choice which is if you want revenue to come in and you don't want to change your tax rates then fiscal drag either in the, in the economist sense, which is earnings being faster than inflation, um, or in the kind of brutal politics sense, which is absolute terms, freeze your thresholds and then allow even inflation plus earnings growth on top of that to drag more people into higher rates over time. And there you've got there you've got straight choices about where you want the revenue to come from if you don't want to go. Like, I, 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 you know, it's in some ways, from an economist perspective, we don't want lots of very high marginal tax rates in as a, in of itself, but but those, there are very real trade-offs about where the revenue comes from if it doesn't come from those sources. So I, I, I'm I'm nervous when people say we can't possibly like there's some kind of absolute limit to how many people can pay any particular given rate. 
particularly because the sensitivity, people's sensitivity to tax rates is very different for different kinds of people. So like single parents and second earners uh, in couples, their behaviour is very sensitive to tax rates. And I would be very careful about how universal credit interacts with tax rates at the bottom for those people. High paid men are you know, you might think this is just says it all, but hyper men are insensitive to the tax rates in their decisions and will basically do what they're going to do anyway, more or less. They, um, so, you know, where you, where you care about depends on who you're, who you care about. Awesome. Yes. David. Just to back Torsten up, so the, um, the freezing across the UK of the additional rate, even though that's devolved, um, thresholds will drag more in. Um, the Scottish... Uh, government's policy of freezing or at least under um, inflation increases in the higher rate will also be a big factor in broadening the tax base up at the higher end. So there's there's two reasons. We supported that freezing of the higher rate tax threshold in Scotland for this year and for future years. One was around increasing tax revenue to hopefully, you know, back to the very start of this session, be able to invest further into public services and into anti-poverty measures too. But the other was, yes, of course, to broaden the tax base so that you're reliant on a greater number of people up at that end too. Um, I think the implications for that, though, um, so whilst we talked earlier around how, of course, a pound-for-pound pound increase in pay for someone on a higher earnings versus a lower earnings will bring more tax revenue at the higher end, that's not to say that pay rises for those at the low end will not be meaningful in terms of the tax revenue they bring in. So roughly, um, if we could get above forecast pay growth for under median wages of 1%, that would be equivalent to freezing the higher rate tax threshold for uh, the next year or two. So this matters. Um, and whilst on the one hand, of course, the higher earners are where we can quite quickly um, get tax revenue in, provided they uh, are sustained in the country, um, down at the low end, we can still make significant increases in revenue, arguably in a more sustainable way than tax rises. David? Just a couple of things. I mean, the, the, the drag point is, is, is well made. Um, uh, if, we, if we hold the, the thresholds constant, clearly earnings growth is, is going to take a look, a, quite a few more people into the higher tax bands. Um, again, I would say... Uh, Hey, it's important for the Scottish Government to think through the uh, interaction of national insurance and income tax because you've got this strange 52% rate being paid by people on kind of upper but not really high, high income. So it's important uh, 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 to think that through. On your original question, Adam, I'm struggling to think of what businesses are out there that are going to generate these extra high earners um, uh, going forward. Uh, it, it's not going to be in the public sector um, that we're going to have uh, a, a lot of extra additional ratepayers. And I mean, I'm assuming that th these would be sort of entrepreneurs um, coming forward with uh, new um, fast growing businesses. And I've got to say, I, I don't see a huge amount of evidence admittedly it's you know it's, it's it's sort of hearsay but i don't see the evidence of that coming forward at the moment i think a number of us are skeptical about these forecasts especially when at the same time the sfc are forecasting that earnings growth in scotland will be lower than it is in the rest of the uk and the employment rate in scotland <coughs> will be lower than it is in the rest of the uk again these are all just forecasts but ma ma matching up these various forecasts with each other has proved a bit of a challenge when we were looking at the budget earlier on in the year Thank you very much. And I just want to contribute at this stage. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. That has been a quite fascinating, I think, informative session. It's been great contributions all around the room. It will certainly help us when we come to meet with the Cabinet Secretary on the 8th of May to give us a good grounding of the things we need to be asking the Scottish Government. Obviously, a lot of this is about with the... The, the powers of the Scottish Government, is the UK Government involved in this as well? Maybe that's something you think about for the future. Um, but thank you. Uh, and I now close this meeting of the Finance Committee. <laughs>